out pretty loudly. Um, so my question is for Sandra. I was just curious, um, the issues that you've addressed regarding gawking, exploitation, all that kind of stuff, the disobedience, do you address that in any pre-trip trainings and what are the sorts of things you say you do? I do. I'm a little hypersensitive about it, so we spend many, many sessions talking about it and then uh, when I was in Rwanda in particular, and this added a whole other dimension of it, I was constantly having debriefing sessions with the students who wanted it, but we were in a very small hotel where we weren't sure if the people that were around us were also survivors. So then this whole other, uh, you know, safe spaces or even any place where you could talk in Rwanda came up. Um, but it's it's very difficult because you can't control everybody's actions at all the time, and you just kind of have to address them as they come up. But not everybody does that. Um, my university does institute it in all their classes. So they have a baseline of what you're supposed to say and what you're supposed to do. But um, I even go into it deeper within the scenarios and then constantly talking about what's happening during the day. But it is very difficult, and I think it's not. I have noticed from other study abroad programs, not my university or SCARS, but other study abroad programs don't touch on it at all. Okay, so I uh, uh, was listening to you when you were talking about uh, your friend advising you, hey, you know, this, this is no longer you know, an anthropological situation, you know, you, you should come home. Um, I've been in a position where I've had to give the same advice to, you know, um, friends of mine who are out, you know, in the field. Um, and I know that Admisha had also talked about, you know, when it was time to, you know, pack up and, and, and leave. I, I think that, especially from a Western perspective, this is a very difficult concept. Um, for us to, because it feels like giving up, it feels like, you know, kind of abandoning, you know, you know the goal and stuff like that. And so how do you deal with, you know, the idea that, you know, sometimes it, that it is best to pack up and leave? With a great difficulty. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not trying to be flip about it, but I think it is a hard decision. I mean, with the, uh, because you realize that part of, your research might be collapsing around you, and, and that's not a pleasant uh, realization, right? Uh, so I, I'm not saying this is easy. You know, the, 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 the decision to be thought of was not an easy one. At the same time, I think we need that when you're working in areas where, um, where it is a context that is very repressive. As in Tajik I mean, Tajikistan has sort of this double whammy, right, of being post-conflict and being pretty authoritarian. Um, and you really have to be mindful of that and, 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 and try not to be so uh, obsessed with your research and that it's just about me, 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 me. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's a hard process. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, in some ways, I think when you're going into these areas, Having these conversations with yourself ahead of time to thinking thinking through that what would what would I do if that was the case right what would I do with my research what are some alternative things that I can do in order for the whole project not to collapse around me right? I mean if you're trying to do your dissertation I you know there's sometimes horror stories a friend of mine who's actually a historian and and uh, there were no human subjects at all involved it was just four boxes of documents that he was searching for and he never found them. Um, you know, so that kind of put a damper on his dissertation. I mean, it didn't, it, 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 he couldn't do the project that he was doing. And, and one, but one of the reasons I'm bringing him up is that one of the things he told me at the time was that he was really kicking himself for not having had any ideas about alternative strategies. If this doesn't work out, what am I going to do, right? What are some other ways that I can actually move my research forward? In his, his case, it was boxes of documents. But I think in this case, uh, you know, is, is there another site I can do with this research? Uh, is there another time when I can come back? Uh, can I get at some of the issues that I'm trying to get at without actually doing interviews? Is there sufficient secondary information that I can draw on? Or do I just need to say, you know, as in this case, uh, we should say, well, we don't have much to say about this part of Tajikistan. This was a conflict assessment that we were doing. You know, we bracketed it and said, we just don't know really what's going on here. It's a, it's a very distinct part of, uh, of the country, and we just didn't have the information. Um, 
you know, and so some questions were left uh, unanswered. Uh, and so is there a way to retool your project in such a way that you don't need that data? Um, I think it's the, but I would sort of suggest that this, these conversations you should have with yourself before going to the field. Uh, so you're not completely uh, in, thrown off uh, and surprised. And at the same time, I think having thought through some of these issues ahead of time, you're more likely to make a decision that it will uh, not make you horrified with yourself years down the line, right? that, that you will be able to sort of sleep at night. Uh, on the other hand, if this is, if you, I think if you hadn't thought through that ahead of time and you're put in that position, um, it might be more difficult to, to, to make that determination. It's time to leave. And you might be kicking yourself for many years to come after afterwards because you did not. Yeah, I mean, this is one thing I actually really like about the anthropology um, ethical guidelines is that they say straight out that your responsibility to the people that you're working with supersedes your responsibility to the generation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this is really quite radical, um, I think, and it's something I take very, very seriously. At the same time, I mean, in that situation, when when my, my, my friend said, you know, I think this isn't research anymore, I think you should go home, um, I didn't go home. And in some ways, I was and remain, um, it's not appalled, but um, troubled by the assumption that as soon as something touches us emotionally, it's no longer research. As soon as something touches us personally, it's no longer research. Um, as soon as we care about the outcome and have opinions um, that you know maybe justice would look like this rather than that, that we should it's no longer research and we should go home. Um, and I didn't go home in that context, and I stayed and have stayed um, and continued to to maybe I think be 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 more humble. Certainly, um, having some old ladies say, oh yeah, we knew that. that. That thing you were stressing about for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, we knew that. Um, not to assume that I knew something that other people, that, that others didn't know. Um, and to really, I think now in a situation like that, how I would have handled it was just to, to assume um, that, that I needed to be much, much more dialogic with people working through what they thought was, was appropriate to do with that knowledge and, and asking them if it should be published, if it should be part of my research, if publication of that um, aspect of something should perhaps be delayed, if you have data that you think shouldn't necessarily be out there in the public domain, um, that would be, I would be less sort of on the, e on the, the internet sending emails to my Western professional friends um, and spending much more time talking to people in that community saying, how do I navigate this ethical dilemma that I'm facing? Um, so, both sides of it. I'm wondering if you could talk, uh, uh, speak to the dissemination of your, uh, your findings and some of the quandaries that you find in dealing with that issue um, in terms of reporting, what you choose to report, not report, um, and the value of it recognizing that if people knew it, it would influence how they make other kinds of decisions about what's going on there. So um, I'd just like to hear you speak to that, if that's clear. Um, I don't think that you can, you certainly can't control who is going to read your work. Um, and so I think that you need to work from the assumption that if you're publishing it, even if it's in some obscure journal, even if it's in the Ask Our newsletter, you know, no matter where it is, um, that not only people in power who have power over that particular situation may be able to access it, um, but that the people who you work with are going to be able to access it. That's not always the case. This is, I think, is another ethical issue that we haven't raised, um, which is what do we do with our scholarly work? You know, some minute percent of work is actually translated back into the language if one is working internationally, um, into the language that it was conducted in, right, and made available to people in a way in which they can actually access it. Um, there's very little <coughs> scholarly translation that is done, and this is actually something that is in the ethical guidelines of the African Studies Association, which has on. Um, it's part of its principles that one should translate one's work, make it available to people in 
in country, um, and that one should support the development of universities, um, faculty development, that one should have, has an ethical responsibility to institution building in that context as well. So the idea that we're actually supposed to share this stuff. But you need to work from the assumption that anybody can read it, right? Um, and so you need to think, this person that I spoke with, what would they think about it? I give my work back to people to read before I publish it. And I let them dialogue with me about, no, this is, I don't want this to be published. You know, I think that you could have maybe said this in a different kind of way. And that's a very humbling experience. It was very, very scary for me to do that as a graduate student. It was bad enough that I had to send things to professors and so on and so forth <laughs> who were going to judge me for the thought of sending it back to the people who I was writing. I mean, it was, it was, it was really, really hard. I'm a lot more comfortable with it now. Um, but sometimes, yes, I do make decisions not, not to publish things because I think that it could incite conflict. Um, and that's a decision you need to be prepared to make. Again, it's very, very hard, I think, especially as a graduate student, with the kinds of pressures you're under and the kinds of overlapping responsibilities you feel to, to faculty, to the people you're working with, and to your sort of sense of sort of self and what would constitute a research disaster. Um, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think the only because I totally agree with that. And just so, just to add one more uh, thing, especially if you don't have the opportunity to do what uh, Leslie has been doing, of giving the the text back to to uh, people you were uh, working with, right, or interviewing, and so forth. That's not possible for whatever reason. Um, is is to make these. Uh, you have to and sometimes. So sometimes you have to make these judgments on your own, right? And, and or in conversations with others, uh, whether you're faculty or other academics, your colleagues, what have you. Um, it, but to also uh, a, make a decision. Well, maybe this should not be. And not see the light of day because, as as you said, you have to assume that anybody can read it. Uh, is there a way of um, addressing some of? In a, in a publication addressing some of the issues that you were considering, but maybe um, removing identifying markers, right? So you can't really place the, uh, uh, the issue in a particular locale. I'm sort of struggling with, uh, the reason I bring that up is that I'm, I'm writing a piece right now where I'm actually going to uh, decontextualize to some extent some of the uh, issues I'm going to be talking about. Because frankly, um, I, I don't think the, the, the people who um, were involved in this particular land dispute, would have wanted to uh, have that uh, be made public in any shape or form. Uh, and I'm not really uh, interested in making it public. I'm interested in exploring some of the dynamics of this particular kind of uh, dispute. Um, and so it really doesn't matter where it took place. You know? And so, so really stripping out the identifying markers and doing uh, and, and, and going forward with that. Right, so if you're more interested, not so much, you know, and again, it depends on, on the discipline you're coming from, right? If you're an anthropologist, that might be very difficult to do. Where I'm sitting, uh, it might be easier to do, to, to do that kind of stripping away of the uh, identifying markers. The other thing is, you know, to really say, well, do, um, do I just need to uh, not put anybody's names in, 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 into it, right? That you're, you're using the interviews as background without actually uh, citing anybody verbatim. Some people want to be cited, right? They really, they, they recognize that they might, uh, there are very high risks to being cited and being quoted, but they want to because they are trying to put a, um, a, their message out. Uh, they, they, they're very uh, intentional about it. Again, something that traditional HSRB process doesn't really recognize very well, um, that not, all, uh, it, people, not everybody that you're interviewing wants to remain anonymous. Some very much want to be in the public domain and, and get their message uh, message out. You know, but again, it depends. Uh, I, I think that this uh, also um, brings up the issue of when you're doing uh, uh, the interviews and, and informed consent and so forth, to recognize that different people will have different experiences with giving interviews. So for instance, when I was interviewing some for my dissertation labor uh, leaders, and some of them were you know, the, the, in the official unions and were really savvy political animals, and as we were talking, they would, you know, without missing a beat, say, and this is off the record. And then, and we're back on the record, <laughs> you know, and boom. Uh, but when I was talking to the shop floor guys, you know, that distinction didn't exist. And so you have to be really mindful of who, um, who it is that you're interacting with and what kind of, um, and how that informed consent actually looks like. Because it might look very differently, you know, depending on, on, on who, it, who it is that you're speaking with. Thank you.
I'm enjoying the presentation, but I was struck by your uh, your quest for a one sentence uh, kind of uh, referring these together. And what came to me was, well, this is reflective practice. This is what's being presented: is is people doing highly reflective practice and high awareness of the ethics and so forth. Um, and and so the question that came to my mind was going back to, to Michael Schiffler's opening remarks of the fellow who introduced himself as, well, I trained these folks to use the violence, and so, you know, there's some pros and cons for hiring me. Um, but what he, what he seemed to have was a self-awareness of how he would be seen in that community and, and what his room for maneuver was and what his appropriate possible roles were and how, where he could push the envelope. Um, and so that self-awareness piece seems to me to be really important to all of the presentations, um, having the awareness of what roles you're playing and what roles you're representing yourself as playing and what roles you can play and, and, and the self-care piece of sometimes you need to go home and sometimes you need to stay. Um, and so for the code of conduct with ethics, I guess I want to ask, you know, maybe we need not only kind of the answers of what we need to do, but also we need what the questions are. <laughs> um, and so one of the codes of conducts, conduct could be, uh, ask yourself these particular questions too. Um, and so what are those questions would be a, a, a component of Much discussion today is about independent research. Can you talk maybe a little bit more about group research projects, maybe evaluations, if you know, speaker talk about, or um, ethics considerations for maybe a junior party working as part of a group on, res on group research projects, especially if maybe those ethics concerns aren't taken on the, the management end of the research project. many group projects. I, uh, I've gone to some of them uh, more group projects. And I think it is um, the, one of the things that I think needs to, needs to happen, especially if you're taking people out to do research uh, for the first time, or they've never done it before, is to really do some pretty intentional training ahead of time to, uh, so that they know what they're doing, more or less, as important as they're possible when they go out into the field, right? So to, to really do a lot of things on the front end. Um, but also, I think, you know, and this, this isn't, um, this was not a research project. This was um, a course that we were running uh, in Liberia last summer. Um, I think as the sort of senior person uh, with junior uh, colleagues and students, you also have to be prepared to step in occasionally and really guide them, even if quite forcefully. Um, Linda's going to laugh at me. She knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, but um, to, to, when you see that, that um, unintentionally uh, your junior partner is about to really do something really stupid, uh, to put it quite bluntly, and really potentially dangerous, uh, and potentially aggravating a conflict that, that, um, that they're trying to uh, mediate, to really be, be prepared to step in and guide them, uh, even if they were really quite uh, Yeah, and just again, to, to intentionally work into one's collaborative practice, the space to have those kinds of discussions and to ask those kinds of, as Susan Allen Nan said, those kinds of questions rather than just assuming. I mean, in a group research project, you know, everybody is vetted by the IRB beforehand, that they've all gone and done their online training, they've all got their certificate, um, you know, the checkbox has been checked, right? But to actually build in more time, in intentional time to discuss issues as they emerge. And that's hard because as, as you, you, um, you implied, there are dynamics of power within collaborative research relationships too, especially if you're working in hierarchical organizations or in academia, which is also hierarchical. So, um, but trying as best one can, as one can to create those spaces. I can actually talk loud enough. Uh, I was just going to ask as a follow-up question because what I heard um, the question being is, is the circumstances where the junior researcher is uncomfortable with the ethics of the senior researcher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what happened in that situation? 
that's even tougher. But you know, I, I mean, but on the other hand, I think you know, and as as difficult as it is, they should speak up. I mean, I, and I and I think it is extremely difficult because you do have these power dynamics. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, I I think we all need to do that. Um, we're all situated in these power dynamics, and to be prepared to to um, to to address that. Um, you know, and, and of course it helps that there is a space for, uh, set up ahead of time to have these conversations, but I think you know, if, you, if you're seeing something in the federal then just because you're the junior person, although of course you need to recognize that there might be some pretty unpleasant consequences to you personally. But it's so, you know, it, it, it's one of these tough, tough decisions that you need to make, but uh, at the same time, I, you know, if you see something really unethical going on, then I want to. Can I? I want to just comment on on this, and this is true. I think with research teams or practitioner teams, the challenge is is that often with group projects like this are, are very often evaluations, and very often the dynamic is that the lead, the senior the senior researcher, is an international expert getting paid whatever five hundred thousand bucks a day, and the junior researchers are nationals of the country, and getting paid a heck of a lot less usually. And so there's a it's what I think is really, and I'm sure many people in this room are going to go and be evaluators. How do you create a dynamic where your re, your research assistants can speak the truth to you? That's an ethical obligation. It's a, and then to be able to listen to and take on those things. I had a funny incident once where I had a researcher um, doing a time to do a focus group with a group of young people, and some of my staff were with him. He was an external consultant. He was an international and all that. And there was an older guy in the back of the room, and he sort of says, excuse me, sir, how old are you? And the guy said, I'm 50-something. He said, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a meeting for youth. And you're not a youth, and so I'd like to ask you to leave. And he left. And my colleagues all you know, were in dismay, and they report back to me. He kicked out the Maoist commander in charge of the village where we were working, right? which was the rebel force. Oops. And so when I gave him the feedback saying, man, why'd you kick the Maoist rebel leader and charge out of the room? And he said, nobody told me. Nobody told me who he was. So the researcher, I mean, and you're going to all be lead researcher most of the time in this kind of dynamic. It is fundamental. You have to create a dynamic where the truth is being spoken to you. And that's true if you're you know, a senior program director or whatever as well. All right, on that note, we're going to wrap up this session. We can continue the discussions along the corridors as we build new networks of colleagues and partnerships. I just want to invite you to give our panel.